Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the worship of God here at St. John's Christian Church on this Sunday morning. I was able to attend what was to be an outdoor gathering yesterday afternoon. We had to meet indoors for some reason, but nobody complained about the rain. Uh, because obviously it was a blessing to have, and, and hopefully there will be a no, uh, more, and there will be enough for all the crops and our lawns and all those kind of things. Today's theme is focused in on testimony, and we're going to be reading uh, the conversion experience of Saul, and, and part of what that led to his testimony later in his life, and we're going to be hearing from um, Brad Roth uh, from a, a testimony about his time on uh, the summer mission trip, and then later in the service, we're going to hear a testimony of Sarah Chrisman Gabert. Uh, so she is one of my younger sisters, and uh, she had shared her testimony recently at the church she attends in Jordan, Minnesota, and I actually asked her mission if I could share it here, uh, as it's a testimony and fits in well with the message. So, um, and then the question of um, the sermon is, what is my testimony? And we're not talking about my testimony but we're each asking that question of ourselves, what is my testimony? And we'll talk about that in a bit. In our worship this morning, we read from Acts chapter 9, verses 3 through 6, and then verses 17 through 19, and this is indeed about Saul's conversion. So Acts 9, verse 3. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, he fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Verse 17. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Let's bow in prayer. Lord, we gather. We gather as your people to praise you, to thank you. To praise you not only for the gift of life that we have, but we praise you for the gift of your word. We thank you for the revelation of Saul's conversion experience and how you took him and, and changed his heart. So he was no longer persecuting, but he was now one of your apostles, spreading the good word of Jesus Christ. Lord, as you touched him and as you touch us, Lord, we pray that our joy would well up within you, within us, to praise you this day. In Christ's name, amen.
look for our opening hymn of praise and worship, Come Thou Almighty King.
then they purchase their houses with a zero interest mortgage provided by Habitat. Families qualify by demonstrating their need for a Habitat house, their ability to pay for it, and their willingness and ability to accomplish their sweat equity hours and other requirements by completing a home owner education program. Need for housing can mean a few different things. It could mean that they live in substandard housing, which would mean there are issues that create health and or safety problems, such as mold, unsafe neighborhoods, poor heating and plumbing, or maybe too few of bedrooms for the number, age, and gender of the household members. Need for housing could also mean that uh, there are people are living in temporary housing or in housing that is too expensive, which is defined as 50% or more of the income being spent for total housing costs, which would include rent and utilities. Now here's some pictures from the week. Like I said, the home would be being built is a split level, four bedroom house. When we arrived on Monday, the house basically looked like this, minus the wall on the top floor. The main floor uh, had the exterior sheeting on and the decking on the floor was on the floor of the top level. As the week progressed, there were crews on each of the levels, as well as the crew that was cutting the lumber and the sheeting and uh, transferring that, those materials to the various crews. The lower level needed a knee wall for insulation as well as interior walls constructed. At Thursday evening, the home looked like this. Our goal was to have all the interior walls complete as well as rafters in place. It was an aggressive goal and we nearly got there, not quite, but nearly got there. There were always many hands of all experience, uh, of all experience levels, and we were all working together. And the many hands made, made the work go fast, and, and it was quite, quite enjoyable. There was also lots of smiles and lots of good-natured jokes. And the veterans like uh, Dwayne and Tammy were more than willing to share their knowledge with the rookies like uh, David. And there's also some standing around, lots of observing and offering of advice and opinions on, on how things should be done. Have fun with that. Mid morning of each day, we would take a break for, for snacks, water, and devotions. This work site had several advantages. There's plenty of shade, plus, we had access to the house you see on the right hand side. This house is a nearly completed habitat house uh, that we were allowed to use. Uh, we were allowed to use the kitchen and the bathrooms. Well, the girls could use the bathrooms, and Avery and I are still trying to figure out the fairness of that. <laughs> and the food. We had breakfast at the hotel. I guess I'm putting breakfast in quotes. Uh, as due to the pandemic, the, ho the hotel could only serve some prepackaged cereal or some semblance of a breakfast, uh, microwavable breakfast sandwich. Uh, but lunch more than made up for the breakfast. The local, local restaurants provided lunch. We always had enough to serve about 30 people, whereas our group was only uh, comprised of about 13 to 17 people, uh, depending on, on how many leaders uh, from the area were there. And for supper, uh, we grilled on site a couple of nights. We had leftovers one night, and one night we uh, ate at Carlson's, the local root beer stand. Uh, best root beer we've ever had, uh, homemade root beer, was very good. And across the street, uh, from Carlson's was Malton's, an ice cream shop that a few of us stopped at a couple of times and drove back to the hotel. Uh, this is Kelly and Avery enjoying some treats. Uh, I believe uh, Avery is trying the Fat Elvis, which was a peanut butter and banana ice cream. And I also heard that Darlene, Gloria, and Dwayne got to be on a first name basis uh, with the ice cream servers at the local Culver's. So why did I go on this trip? I wanted to do this for a long time, but always made excuses like, hey, I'm too busy at work, or I didn't want to take the time away from my family. As Avery has gotten older, he has mentioned several times that he would like to go on a habitat uh, trip and, and help build a house. And then this year, uh, all of his summer plans got canceled, little eating camp, baseball, and our family vacation. So when I brought up uh, to my family the, the, the possibility of going on this trip, he was excited. And uh, in my opinion, Amy and Evie were a little bit too excited, too, about getting the boys out of the house for a week. 
So I talked to Pastor Eric and contacted the LaPorte County Habitat. The, rule, the general rule is that a person must be 16 to work on a job site. They made an exception for him as long as he didn't run power tools and uh, stayed off of ladders. He would kind of rolled his eyes at this a little bit, but uh, we decided to go. When I asked Avery what, what he learned from his experience, he listed uh, the following things. Carlson's has the best root beer, and Bubbles, Bubbles has the best ice cream. He said he learned that wall studs are spaced at 16 inches, and tape measures highlight multiples of 16. That Paul Buer was a radiologist, and it would be interesting, interesting to be one, but it takes too much schooling. <laughs> David and Jonathan were two of the best divers in the state in high school. He learned how Wayne asked Linda to, Linda to the prom back in high school. And he also said he was the only one not too proud to carry a cat's paw in his tool belt to correct mistakes. A cat's paw is a tool, uh, kind of a pry bar for pulling out nails. Uh, so a lot of people actually had, had, had to borrow his. He also wished we were able to stay at the camp instead of the hotel. It would have been fun to be able to gather around a campfire at night. We would also be, have given him room, a larger place to roam, to find a quiet place to sleep. You see, he shared a room with his uncle Greg and I, and then one night he tried sleeping in the bathtub because he claimed he was in, uh, in between what sounded like a, a garbage disposal and an angry black bear. <laughs> and so what did I get out of, out of this experience? Well, three main things. Habitat's website, website states that it provides an opportunity for people to put their faith into action bring diverse groups of people together to build homes and community. And I saw faith in action every day. The morning break with devotions and sharing was a highlight. The simple devotions and discussions were fantastic. And even though our group may not seem diverse, it did include a 12-year-old, two college kids, several retirees. It had males and females, and had a first-time mission participants, as well as people that had been doing this for upwards of 20 years. Yet everyone was able to interact with one another and we were able to build new and stronger friendships. And secondly, I observed the group living out the core values of, of Habitat. Uh, these, these would include collaboration, community engagement, compassion, enthusiasm, innovation, integrity, quality, respect, results, and stewardship. Every day the experienced people patiently shared their knowledge, showing me and other newbies how to build a house and allowing us to uh, swing the hammer. The willingness to help and encourage others kept things fun. All team members and family were treated with respect at all times. It was a great example of how Christians should work, live, and play. And finally, I got to spend a whole week with my son. Now he wasn't as appreciative of, it, of this as me, as many times he would say to me, just go, 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 leave me alone, leave me alone, I know what I'm doing. But I'm so appreciative, appreciative of the rest of the group accepting him, interacting with him, and teaching him not only construction, but more importantly, values and how to conduct oneself. Thank you. Thank you, Brad, for sharing those informative and encouraging words. Let us join together in our hymn of commitment, I have decided to follow Jesus. Please stand as you're able.
Mary Silcox, Sharon Von Dalen, Jan Lindsay, and their families as they grieve the recent loss of loved ones. Be also with Shirley Fowler as her son Rick is in hospice care during this time. Oh Lord, for those who are dealing with various health situations, we pray for physical healing, if it might be your will, but especially for the inner well-being that marks those who know your love and have been saved by your grace. We pray for Darlene King and Callie Roars recovering from their surgeries. We pray for Catherine Graber recovering from injuries from her car accident. We pray for Chloe, the Merillette's granddaughter, who's facing surgery to remove a cancerous vertebra. And we pray for Sue Kinsman and Sandy Miller who are recovering from infections. And we pray for Karen Rock, who will be here is tuning in now. And we just praise you that she's made it to rehab and pray that she can continue to recover well and know you are with her. Lord, we join to these prayers, all the other prayers of our hearts, as we join in the Lord's Prayer, praying together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the power, the power and the glory forever. Amen. As I shared earlier, we're going to hear a testimony from one of my younger sisters. Uh, my sister Sarah, she's about a year and a half younger, uh, grew up in the same home, going to church, doing all the same activities. Um, I went to Pilgrim Hills uh, Church Camp for my first job after high school, and when it was uh, her after time of high school, she joined me at Pilgrim Hills. I went to Defiance College, and when she graduated from high school, she went to Defiance College for a year or so. Um, and then she moved to Montana and spent some time out there, and I'm just going to say she had some wayward times, and she's going to allude to that in uh, the testimony she's going to offer. Um, I'd say 25, 30 years ago, my sister was uh, diagnosed with sarcoidosis, which is a lung disease. Um, she's borderline being on lung transplant list. Um, we're still surprised that she's still alive on how serious it has been. Uh, I think as long as my kids have known their aunt, she's been on oxygen 24-7, uh, so 25, 30 years, um, but still um, is, doing, is doing as well as she can, and she is connected to a Lutheran church in Jordan, uh, Minnesota, and she's uh, kind of led the prayer team there. She works in their office, and they asked her to do a testimony a little while ago, and she shared that with her family. I saw it and asked if we could show it today. So here's part of my sister's testimony. Tonight's reading is from Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the 3 o'clock prayer service. As they approached the temple, a man lame from birth was being carried in. Each day he was put beside the temple gate, the one called the Beautiful Gate so he could beg from the people going into the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. Peter and John looked at him intently, and Peter said, Look at us! The lame man looked at them eagerly, expecting some money. But Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have in the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene. Get up and walk. Then Peter took the man, lame man by the right hand and helped him up. And as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. He jumped up, stood on his feet, and began to walk. Then walking, leaping, and praising God, he went into the temple with them. All the people saw him walking and heard him praising God. When they realized he was the lame beggar they had seen so often at the beautiful gate, they were absolutely astounded. They all rushed out in amazement to Solomon's colonnade where the man was holding tightly to Peter and John. Peter's, that was it. 
I'm struck in this reading that um, this lame man is begging for money, um, asking for money. Um, he's not asking for healing, but that's what he gets. Um, and it reminds me of my own life because I prayed and prayed and prayed for healing for my lungs. Um, that didn't happen. I was kind of angry about that, but then I realized that God healed me in a different way, um, in a better way. He healed, um, you know, he took from me the baggage um, that I'd been carrying around, um, all the damage I'd done when I was drinking and, um, you know, that forgiveness of his and that grace. Um, and he healed me from within and made me a new and better person. Um, and I just think it's, it's kind of strange that um, he doesn't always give us what we ask for, but he gives us what we need. Um, and so that's what I think of when I think of this, these wonderful passage that we heard tonight. This morning is from Ephesians, Paul's letter to the Ephesian church. And as a word of introduction, I just want to share that racism isn't just a modern issue, but it's been around in the world for a really long time. The Apostle Paul himself, at one time, thought he was better than other people just because of his race and ethnicity. Um, and he took pride in who he was. And so as we talk about how God is our hero by meeting our various needs, one of the ways he is Paul's hero is that he meets his need for humility. Paul was a very proud man, and the Lord humbles him. Well, as we look at this passage, Paul is going to be sharing about how the people he once looked down upon, the Lord's called him to be the minister of the gospel, the Gentiles. And as we listen to this, we can be grateful because unless you have a Jewish ethnic background, we too are among the Gentiles who have been saved from Paul's ministry and the ministry of others reaching out beyond the Jewish people. So join me now in Ephesians chapter 3 as Paul shares a bit of his story. Ephesians 3 verse 1. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, surely you have heard about the administration of God's, God's grace that was given to me for you. That is, the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ which was not made known to men in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all God's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. Thanks be to God. For his holy word. join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, gracious God, loving Lord, we thank you for the revelation of your word. And we pray that as we look at 
this glimpse of Paul's letter and a glimpse of his life. Lord, may we soak it in, may we take it to heart what our own testimony of sharing the gospel, the mystery of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to take it in that we might be able to share more and more of that good news. In Christ we pray. Amen. Over the past few months, there have been a few people that have asked me the question, how did my seminary education prepare me to be a pastor of a church through these days of global pandemic? And I went back through my mental log and I went through all the classes that I had, and surprisingly, I had no seminary class on global pandemic and the church's response. And as I was doing that mental exercise, I was reminded why I did go to seminary. Seminary, the education I had, prepared me to be a pastor of a church to preach the gospel. No pandemic, no social reform, no, you know, if how to care for the earth, those kind of things. It was about preaching the good news and enabling people to share their testimony of Christ. Now, there were classes, there were um, conversations and discussions about all of uh, administration of church, but the main focus was what Paul is revealing for us in Ephesians 2 and in Ephesians 3. Paul's words that we read from Ephesians 3 seem to summarize what I did learn in seminary. In a certain understanding, the verses right before Ephesians 3 in Ephesians 2, 19 through 22, those words provide the backdrop for what Paul was about in his missionary teaching, as well as provides the backdrop for a pastor's role in the church, which is what I studied in seminary. So I want to read for you Ephesians 2, verses 19 through 22, and these are the verses right before what Pastor Alex has read for us this morning. It says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. We're not strangers. In the church, the gospel brings us together, unites us together, that we might be one family. God's people and members of God's household. Verse 20. Built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief Cornerstone. The church of St. John's is not new. We did not build it. It was founded upon the foundation of generations before, going back to the apostles and to the prophets, and the direction comes from the chief cornerstone, Jesus Christ. Verse 21. In him where the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. The church is meant to bring people together. That's what's the unfortunate aspect during the pandemic is the whole social distancing and all kinds of other thoughts and questions. We do not have that sense of unity, so we're trying to do our best, and we look forward to that day when that unity, when we can join together spiritually and physically, join together in a holy temple to the Lord. Verse 22, and in him you two are being built together to become a dwelling which God lives by his spirit. It is that process of building together for today and for the future through the presence and the power of God's spirit. In these words of Ephesians 2, Paul is teaching the Ephesian disciples how Christ Jesus is forming them into the church, being built together as one body. Not the Ephesians church, not the Roman church, not the Colossians church, not St. John, St. Martin, St. Luke's, but one church. That even though we may worship and belong to a different congregation, still the churches, they are together the church universal, with Christ Jesus as the chief cornerstone. That's what binds us together. Paul's words in Ephesians 2 and Ephesians 3, they are words of education. They are words that we need to know, so as we share our testimony, it will come from a source of knowledge. They're words of education, but they're also words of direction. That we are supposed to be formed together and 
then we can share the testimony that God gives to each one of us. God gives us a testimony, and it's a different testimony to each of us as individuals. So these words of education and direction, they're not just for the Ephesians, they're for us today. Because Christ is constantly trying to disciple these people to be more united, more united, to grow the kingdom, to grow the kingdom. The church, built on the foundation laid by Christ. So, in this passage, it's about fellow citizens. We are together, no matter our nationality or whatever our background might be, fellow citizens. Built on that one foundation with Christ Jesus as the chief cornerstone. Christ Jesus is the one that is building us up, building us up in the kingdom. Which brings us to Ephesians 3, which begins with, for this reason. Referring back to 19 through 22 about being built together, united together. For this reading, building together disciples of Christ to be the church. Not individual congregations, but the church universal. What we have in common. Paul summarizes key aspects of his personal testimony in these verses from Ephesians 3 that we've read. Now, when you look at Ephesians 3, there is a lot to teach from. But the purpose that I had this for us this morning is to look how Paul reveals aspects of his personal testimony. So that it might be an example for us. Paul is providing evidence. He's providing inspiration and support. He's providing reasons why his readers, why his readers, which includes us, why we should believe in his mission work to the Gentiles. So as we break this passage down, Paul says that he is a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Now, he really is in prison. He's being watched 24 hours a day. He's not free to roam around. He's in prison. But for him, that pales in comparison to him being captured by God as a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He is not, Paul is not concerned about whether he has to wear a mask, whether he has to stay six foot away from others, whether he's going to have good food in jail or whatever. His concern, his primary uh, role in life is to be a prisoner of Christ Jesus, to know and believe in Jesus Christ and share the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ with others. Even though he's in prison, he has a greater concern. He's not worried about his physical self. And he's a prisoner of Jesus Christ for the sake of the Gentiles, expanding the kingdom. He's seeking to reach all. And that's why the church has so many different congregations. It's why the church has so many different people involved, because we each can reach somebody different as we spread the good news to the kingdom. And then Paul writes about the administration of God's grace given to me for you. The administration of God's grace when Saul was saved on the road to Damascus, he had that experience knowing Christ as Lord, the one that he had been persecuting. But now the Lord got a hold of his life, changed his heart, gave him grace, and then renewal came and he became one of the apostles of the church. He became the missionary of the early church. The administration of God's grace to me for you. What God gives us is not for ourselves alone. God gives to us so that we might share with others. And then Paul writes about the mystery. The mystery made known to me by revelation. It's not something that Paul came across himself. It's something that God revealed to him. In the mystery, in the Greek word of uh, the mystery form, in the Greek it is an aspect of of knowledge that humans don't know or humans cannot understand. But it's only come to us by the revelation of God. So the people didn't know who Jesus really was, but as Jesus, as God revealed Jesus to the people, they came to a greater understanding. There was no more sense of mystery. And then Paul talks about the Gentiles and that they are one with the Jews. There is no sense of elitism by the Jews, but they are joined together as one. In Paul's testimony, 
was to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. That's why there's never an end for what pastors can preach on. Because if, no matter we preach every single minute of our lives, there's unsearchable riches of Christ to be known someday down the road. And then Paul gives a very specific word. To make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery. To make plain to everyone. I want you to remember that as a key aspect of the testimony. So I want us to consider this passage of scripture in terms of Paul giving us an outline of how we can share our testimony of faith. Now, when I talk about our testimony, your specific testimony, it doesn't mean that you have to come up here and share like Brad did this morning. It doesn't mean that we're going to videotape you and put you on a screen in some other congregation to hear about. It doesn't have to be up front. If you want to, we certainly can provide that platform. But our testimony, my testimony, is of great value when we just share with the people that we meet. Now, this last week, my family enjoyed some days of camping. And, you know, it was a very large campground. There's a camper here, we're in the middle, and there's a camper on the next door. We had friendly neighbors, and, and they would call out, and they wanted to talk a little bit more. I was just trying to veg out a little bit. But it reminds me, wherever we are, there are people that we can talk to. It's not just in our hometowns. It's not just where we work or where we go to school. God is going to bring people into our lives that we can connect with, that we can offer our testimony. So what does Paul give us as an outline? First, it wasn't Paul's doing. God was calling him and working through him. Now, I have to be careful about what I say about my sister because she's either listening now or I know she's going to listen later. But I am astounded that she has come to the point in her life where she would be willing to be videotaped and have her testimony shared. That's not what I know about my little sister. But God has called her. God has equipped her to share her testimony. Now, Sarah, if you're listening, hear this well. If Sarah can do that, we can do that. That's what Paul is telling us. It's not Paul's doing. It's God's calling. And then Paul maintained a humble attitude. He was pretty proud of himself as a Jew, as a Pharisee. But then God humbled him on that road. And he realized it was no longer Paul, but it was God. And Paul's life as a prisoner for Christ Jesus was lived to bring glory to God. Paul's outline of testimony includes his earthly trials. They were insignificant to his preaching of the gospel. He was driven to share. And whatever was going on in his life... It did not matter. He was still going to be preaching the gospel. Paul witnessed to both Jew and Gentile. We don't get to pick and choose who God is going to be called for us to share to. We just have to be obedient listeners. He witnessed to both Jew and Gentile. And Paul referred to his calling, the administration of God's grace. You can read about that in Acts chapter 9. His conversion moment. He referred to that. So as you think about the testimonies that we've heard this morning. Now, Brad didn't necessarily share a testimony of when he was converted. His testimony was one of encouragement. And the aspect of going on a mission trip or going on some, a similar experience is that we need encouragement from day to day. And that was done in the context of a group of Christians. And in that context, how uh, Brad, you phrased it, that we were putting our faith in action. We don't act by ourselves, but it was a group effort. And that is meant to be a testimony of encouragement to all that who can go on those trips? Anyone. Anyone can go on those trips. And those trips provided an opportunity for us to grow in our faith. Or my sister Sarah. Giving witness to some of her testimony in her rebirth in Christ. Something that she grew up with, something that she was wayward for a while, and then she's come back to. Those are experiences, like what Paul experienced, 
that we can share with others. Not to boast, not to build ourselves up, but that's what Jesus Christ has equipped us to do. Now, each one of us, we each know different people. You people know people that I don't know. I'm not going to be able to reach to them. But as we learn our testimony, and over the course of August, we're going to be talking about how to do this more and more, the lies in the house and those kind of things. But the aspect of the testimony is it's not your choice. It's God's calling. It's God's calling. Remember that from the aspect of Paul and, and I mean, Brad, you didn't volunteer. I asked you, right? You know, my sister didn't volunteer. She got asked. We're always welcome for volunteers. But it's the aspect when God calls, we need to be praying for people to be able to respond. One of the aspects about the outline that Paul gives is he's giving glory to God. He's giving glory to Jesus Christ. I do that in a different way in my life. And one of the odd things, you may find it odd that I think I started this when I was 50. Uh, I thought that was pretty old in this world as I look at my birthday buddy, Bud Beck. Um, we share the same birth date, but not the same year. Just so you're aware of that. Um, I've already written my all of my funeral arrangements. Uh, I haven't written the actual fun funeral meditation yet. I I'm going to leave that to the pastor that might be around when that happens. But I have written my own obituary. And in my obituary, I have listed all of the people that were a significant encouragement to me in my life of faith. And that is my way of telling anybody that might come to that. The aspect of it wasn't about Eric. It was about how people impacted my life for the glory of Jesus Christ. That's part of my testimony. I shed that because I can be a pretty proud person. You could ask my sisters when they were little where I was. I have been humbled in life. And, and so I want to deflect that glory to others. And as I think about that list, because I periodically go back and adjust things, I add another person's name, those kind of, I've never removed anybody, okay? Um, but I look at that list, and I remember my life and my testimony, and it spurs me on. It encourages me to continue to share with other people. And it's that aspect of who has inspired us. So in telling your testimony, look back at those people. They inspired you. How can you inspire others? And the foundation of faith continues to go and go and go. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the examples of Paul and Brad and Sarah this morning. A willingness to share part of their story, part of their faith story, their testimony. Lord, I pray that you would further equip each one of us, whether we think we can do this or not. Lord, I pray that you would impress upon each one, each one that's here, each one that's listening to him, each one that will hear this later. Lord, make us your disciples. Lord, we have chosen to follow Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Now, Lord, I pray that you would empower each one of us to define, describe, create our own faith story, that we might be a blessing in your kingdom. Bring another's peace and you glory. In Christ we pray. Amen. Let's join together in singing uh, Jesus is Lord of All. After the benediction, a benediction the song will be blessed be the tie that binds. Please rise as you are.
This word of benediction from 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Stand firm. Let nothing move you. Give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, because you know your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Amen. <laughs> Are the people so running in bed tonight? 